And a lot of people ask me, you know, what's the best advice to someone who wants to be a director? And the answer I give is very simple. Be a director. Pick up a camera, shoot something, no matter how small, no matter how cheesy, no matter whether your friends and your sister star in it, put your name on it as director. Now you're a director. Everything after that, you're just negotiating your budget and your, and your fee. Uh, so it's a state of mind is really the point. Uh, once, you, once you commit yourself to do it, then the hard part starts, which is that you have to forswear all other paths because you can't keep a foot in cabinet making and a foot in directing. You can't keep a foot in one job and it, it's, it's a total and all-consuming thing. And I suspect that many of the difficult and challenging things in the world, whether it's research or whatever, but certainly in the arts, must be all-consuming because you're in competition with people who have made that decision, who have committed themselves 100%. You're competing for resources. You know, it's just, it's a big coral reef and uh, it's a big food chain and you're competing for resources and you're competing against people who have made that commitment. If you don't make the same commitment, you're not going to compete. It's that simple. You never really get an opportunity. You take an opportunity. Uh, you know, the, the, in, the film, in the filmmaking business, no one ever gives you anything. Nobody ever taps you on the shoulder and say, you know, I've, I've, really, I've really admired the way, you, uh, the way you talk and the way you draw. I think you'd make a good director. It doesn't happen that, that way. You have, to, you have to constantly be pulling on somebody's sleeve saying, hey, I want to direct, I want to direct, I want to direct. And you have to be willing to make sacrifices to, to do that. Uh, the mistake a lot of people, I think, make in, in, in Hollywood is that they, they think, well, I'll get to the top of my field as a, whatever, editor, production designer, writer, and then I'll just move laterally into directing and I'll be more respected and I'll have more, more power. It doesn't work that way because you drop right to the bottom of the, of the, the, the pack as a, as a director. You have to work your way up in that. I'm not saying it's not done, but, but um, so the, the, the way I did it was I came in through production design which is good because you're thinking visually and you're very aware of the, of the director's problems in trying to tell a story and how the, the environment is you know, a manifestation of the narrative in, in, in some way. And um, you know, I, I, I sort of proved myself as a production designer in, the, in the, the scrappy stay up all night for 15 days in a row kind of independent uh, filmmaking uh, that was done at, at Roger Corman's place. This was in the, in the uh, early 80s. And uh, when, they, when they see that you have the creativity and the stamina and that you basically understand filmmaking, it's not a ridiculous leap in that, in, in that environment to say, I now want to try my hand, I want to, I want to direct. Uh, and I just basically went up to Roger one day and said, I'd like to direct second unit on this, the film that, that we were making at the time, which was a low budget science fiction horror picture. And um, he, gave me a camera and a couple, two or three people, and we started a little second unit, and the second unit basically became this steamroller that wound up shooting about a third of the picture because they were falling way behind on, on first unit. So they'd give me the actors and say, well, do scene 28 and scene 42, and all of a sudden I was working with actors, and that was terrifying because I hadn't really thought that part through yet, you know, that in order to direct you have to work with actors. It's not just about sets and visual effects. and. So it was simultaneously a, a shock and a joyful discovery because I found that all actors really want is some sense of what a writer can bring to the moment, some sense of a narrative purpose. What, what am I doing? What am I, trying to, what am I trying to do here? What's the scene about? Uh, and it's really pretty much that simple. So it was, that was the next epiphany, if you will, which is this part of it is fun too. The part I didn't expect to be fun, the part I didn't expect to be good at, turned out to be, in a way, the most fascinating part. I wouldn't say I was good at it right away. It took, it took me a long time to realize that um, you, you have to have a, a bit of a, an interlanguage with actors. Uh, you have to give them something that they can act with. You can't tell them a lot of abstract information about how their character is going to pay off in this, in this big narrative ellipse that happens in scene 18. That doesn't help them. You know, they're in a room. They have to create a, a, an emotional truth in a moment, and um, you know, they, they have to be they have to be uh, able to create that very quickly. So they need they need real tangible stuff, and that's that's a learned art, I think. But um, coming from 
from writing and understanding what they're feeling and what they're thinking, what the character's feeling and thinking, and having thought about that a lot for months in advance is, is the way that, that I get enough respect from the actors that, that they trust what I'm saying, they trust what I'm giving them to do. I was hired to direct a film called Piranha 2. I was hired by a very unscrupulous producer who worked out of, out of Italy. And, um, he, and I, he put me with an Italian crew who spoke no English, even though I was assured that they would all speak English. And I actually had to learn some, some Italian very quickly. And I'm talking about in two weeks, because that's all the prep time I had, because I was actually replacing someone else. And I was put into an untenable uh, situation and then, and then fired several couple of weeks into the, into the shoot and, and the producer took over directing. And it turns out that he had actually done that twice before on his two previous films and that was his modus operandi in order to get the financing and then ax the director. And in the course of, of throwing me off the movie, he never showed me a foot of the film that I had shot. He, he held on to the dailies. He wouldn't, we were shooting in Jamaica and he would, I would shoot in Jamaica, the dailies would go to New York, be processed. He'd fly to New York and look at them and not send them back for me to see. So I wasn't even seeing my own film. So he, you know, he basically came in and said, your stuff doesn't work, doesn't cut together, it's a pile of junk and you're off the movie. And then he took over the film. And I thought, you know, I, I really don't, I mean, okay, maybe, maybe I'm just bad. Maybe I'm just not good. So I went to, um, you know, a couple of months later, I went to Rome to find out sort of the truth, like what, what really happened. And he wouldn't show me any of the film. And I had been in Rome prepping the film for a couple of weeks before we went, and I remembered the code to, to get in. And so um, I went in and I just ran the film for myself. And it wasn't that bad. Because all I wanted to know was just one simple fact. Could I or could I not do this job? And so, and I made a few changes, you know, <laughs> before I flew back, which I don't know if they ever caught. I, I don't know if the editor ever noticed that I actually fixed a couple things. But, uh, uh, but you know, I had to, I had to know whether, whether what they had said was true. So here's a case where everyone around me had basically said, you stink, you suck, you don't know what you're doing. And I just, and I accepted it. But then a little voice kept saying, I don't think so. I don't think it could be that bad. I remember doing some pretty cool stuff with the actors in this moment and that moment. And I looked at it and it was fine. So then I thought, you know what, I, I actually can do this. And I just fell in with a pack of you know, thieves and wackos here. And, but I also realized that I was gonna have to get busy and create my own thing, that nobody would hire me after that experience. Nobody would hire me and just put me on a film. I'd have to create my own thing and hang on tenaciously to that in order to be able to direct again. And that's why I wrote The Terminator. And I had many, many people trying to buy that script, but I wouldn't sell them. I wouldn't sell the script to them unless I went with it as the director. And of course, that was a turnoff for almost everybody. But we did find one low budget producer who was willing to make the film. And that was John Daly at Hemdale. And that's how I got my real start. The road to success is like Harold and the Purple Crayon. You draw it for yourself. You have to imagine it first, and then you have to draw it, and then you have to walk it. But uh, I think many people draw many lines that don't necessarily lead there, but the ones that do lead there are done by that, are done by that process. And not, not for everybody. Some people can fall into good luck. Uh, some people can have it handed to them, but I think the great majority uh, map it out for themselves. But you always have self-doubts, and when you're working in a uh, a public art form like filmmaking, you don't really need self-doubt because if it's, if it's bad, you're gonna hear about it, exactly what's wrong with it, and if it's good, you'll hear what's good about it. So there are plenty of other people who will in, in, inform you. Uh, so self-doubt is not really, is not really uh, necessary. You can sort of just set that one aside, just drop it at the door. Uh, what you need is a lot of confidence to stand up to the slings and arrows, the, the, the barrage of negativity. Because what basically it boils down to is that um, we, we exist in a peer environment. And when we're, when we're sort of on the fringe or on the outside and we're trying to get in, all our peers are like us. And just a, just a bunch of friends or people with, with similar interests. And none of them think you're special. They think they're special. So no one's going to give you uh, encouragement or very few people will give you encouragement. Um, they'll it's like that old adage, it's not enough to succeed, your friends must also fail. 
you know. <laughs> so you're not going to get a lot of tr tremendous encouragement from your peer group, and you can't feed you can't feed on that energy. You can actually support each other in very tangible ways, but I think that that thing of Dude, you got it. You're going all the way. You're not going to hear that, and you're certainly going to you're, you're certainly going to face rejection after rejection. You're going to knock on a lot of doors, and you're going to have to prove yourself. Um, but I think, you know, I think you kind of know that going in. If you're if you're going into the filmmaking process, I think you, you have to go in with your with your eyes open that that's what it's going to be like. And there's a, here's the, an interesting thing that there's a tremendous temptation. To do a workaround, or to do to do a moral or, or, or ethical workaround or shortcut in a lot of situations, because it's easier and it's just you, you're you're so needy to get those little breaks and so on. And I think a lot of people get get sort of um, um, ethically short circuited at that stage, and they never recover. You know, because I think a lot of people would say, well, you know, I'll do what I have to do now, but then later I'll be good. It doesn't work that way. You are who you are. And I, you know, fortunately, I've managed to, to get where I am without, with the occasional burglary aside, uh, without having to, to really uh, um, um, hurt anybody or, or go against my word. I think ultimately your word becomes the most important thing that you have. It's the most important currency that you have. Having a successful film is very important currency as well, but in the long run, your word is the most important thing. And if you say you're going to do something, you have to do it. Um, and I think that that's what, what saw me through on Titanic. Titanic was in some ways the roughest uh, project that, that I've ever been involved with. And what saw me through on that was that I had a relationship with the people who were quite rightly panicking, uh, but they never completely panicked because they knew who I was. And we always treated each other with a kind of a, a respect. And I always, I always did what I think was the the right or ethical thing throughout that, even though it was costing me millions of dollars personally, um, right out of my pocket. To do it, I felt I had to do it, uh, or they would never trust me again on another film. And I think that that's ultimately the most imp important currency that, that you reap from any situation. Pretty much every day. But you know, the thing is that when, when you're in a leadership position, you can never, ever manifest that. You can never manifest the panic that you feel inside. Um, and Titanic was a situation where I felt, I think, pretty much like the officer felt on the bridge of the ship. I could see the iceberg coming far away. But as hard as I turned that wheel, there was just too much mass, too much inertia, and there was nothing I could do. Um, but I still had to. I still had to play it through. There was no way to get off, and so then you know you're in this kind of um, situation where you f you feel you feel quite doomed, and yet you still have to play by your own ethical standards. You know, no matter where it where it takes you. You know, and ultimately that was the salvation, because I think if 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 I hadn't done that. They might have panicked, they might have pulled the plug, things might have been very different, it, the whole thing might have, might have crashed and burned, but it didn't. You know, we held on, we missed the iceberg by that much. Well, Titanic was conceived as a love story, and if I could have done it without one visual effect, I would have been more than happy to do that. Uh, the fact is that, you know, the ship hasn't existed since 1912, at least not at the surface. Um, so we had to create it somehow. I visualized making a lot of big sets and so on and keeping the, the visual effects to a minimum. But uh, it turned out that obviously it was, a, it was a big visual effects show before we were all said and done. But that wasn't really my, my motivation to make the film. And I don't think that should ever be the motivation to make a film. That it should, it should be a means to an end. Um, you know, certainly there's a, an aspect uh, of me that likes big challenges big stuff, you know, whether it's, whether it's big physical construction or visual effects or whatever. I think that's what I do best, and I think there are other people that work at a much more intimate level and do that solely that are better at that, you know. But I think that, in, that it was definitely a goal of, of, of Titanic to integrate a very personal, very emotional, and very intimate filmmaking style with spectacle and try to make that not be 
kind of chocolate syrup on a cheeseburger, you know, make it somehow work together. I think the spectacle got people's attention, got them to the theaters, and then the emotional, cathartic uh, experience of watching the film is what made the film work. Um, because, and, and I think also, I think the spectacle served it, but was not the defining factor in its success. Once again, I think it's a question of balance. It's sort of like looking at a painting and saying what part of the painting was, is the part that, that makes you like it. It's sort of all of it, and it's all of it working together that makes you like the painting. I didn't know for a long time. I was fascinated by the sciences. When I was a kid, I used to spend all my time out collecting pond water and looking at it through my microscope and trying to identify the, the various protozoa, or I'd be looking through a telescope trying to find the great nebula in Orion or, or whatever, you know, my, my brain was going in all these different directions. Art was always sort of there, I was always drawing, but it hadn't really manifested itself as the, as the main thing. And uh, all the way through high school, even into college, I, I majored in physics. Uh, I hit a kind of a wall with, with the maths, uh, and you know, possibly with, with a bad teacher who kind of turned me off to, uh, to calculus uh, um, at, at a critical moment. And even though my grades were very high in astronomy and, and physics, um, I switched to, uh, to English because I wanted to write. Uh, so I, it, was, it was sort of going in two different directions. It was a long time. It was about, I, I would say I was 25 or 26 before I really settled in and said, this is it, this is the decision, I'm gonna work in film in some capacity. And what finally attracted uh, me to film in such a definitive way was it was the only place I could reconcile the need to tell stories and to work in a visual art medium and the desire to understand things at a techn technological level and my fascination with, with engineering and technology. It's one of the few uh, uh, media that are, are you know, so dependent on technology. So it was a way to fuse those interests. I didn't know where I'd wind up within film. I, I actually started as a model builder and quickly progressed into production design, which made sense because I could draw, I could paint, and so on. But I kept watching that guy over there who was moving the actors around and setting up the shots, and, and uh, I, I had never quite pictured myself as a, as a director. I had pictured myself as a filmmaker, but I had never pictured myself as a director, if that makes any sense at all. I mean, I, I had wanted to make films, and I understood at some intellectual level that the director was the person who was most in charge creatively, but I'd never sort of pictured myself in that role, kind of standing up there, the guy with the, the, the monocle and the megaphone, you know, um, had no meaning for me. Uh, but then I watched a couple of really bad directors work, and I saw how they com they completely botched it up and, and missed the visual opportunities of the scene. When we had put things in front of them as opportunities, set pieces, props, and so on, and they had these great actors to work with, and they just blew it. And there was a moment where I said, I may not be very good at this, but I know I'm better than that guy. And that was kind of a critical moment, because when you realize that you can at least be better than somebody else who's already doing it, then you can visualize yourself doing the job. There were several light bulbs at several different times, and the first one was when I saw 2001 A Space Odyssey for the first time. And the, the light bulb there was, uh, you know, a movie can be more than just telling a story. It can be a piece of art. It can be something that has a profound impact on your imagination, on your appreciation of how music works with the images and so on. It sort of just blew the doors off the whole thing for me and, and at the age of 14 and I started thinking about film in a completely different way and got fascinated by it. It's also, to my knowledge, one of the first films that really had a definitive making of book. It was such a, a fascinating film that they actually, they, they, they made a book about the making of 2001. It's the first one that I knew of that was available and I read it from cover to cover 18 times and didn't understand half of it until many years later. But it started a process, a process of, of projecting myself into the, into the idea of actually creating images using these high-tech means. Of course, I did all my, my low-tech analogs of those means, you know, by buying models and gluing them on pieces of glass and moving them around. But it was good training to think spatially and to think, uh, you know, in terms of storyboarding and so on. So I was already a filmmaker, but I hadn't really realized it yet. And then 
Ironically, that was happening in Canada, thousands of miles from, from Hollywood, and, uh, and we subsequently moved at the, at the age of 17 for me to Los Angeles, which is very close to, you know, the, 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 the black hole of Hollywood itself. And yet at that point, I, I sort of said, well, I, I don't know if I can get there from here. I don't, I don't know if, uh, you know, who am I to say that I could be a filmmaker? It didn't make any sense. Um, so I abandoned it for, for grown-up things, and I decided to be a scientist. Uh, and it wasn't until, you know, many years later that I realized that this is really where my, my heart lay, you know. Um, and then the next light bulb was really just the one that says, just do it. Just pick up a camera and start shooting something. Don't wait to be asked because nobody's going to ask you. And don't wait for the perfect conditions because they'll never be perfect. It's a little bit like having a child. If you wait until the right time to have a child, you'll die childless. Uh, and I think filmmaking is very much the same thing. You just have to take the plunge and just start shooting something. Even if it's bad, you can always hide it, but you will have learned something, you know. I didn't really have anything to say, but I had a lot of images, a lot of things crowding into my, to my mind visually. Um, I had read tons of science fiction. I was fascinated by other worlds, other environments. For me, it was, it was fantasy. It was not, but it was not fantasy in the sense of pure escapism. It was, um, as uh, uh, Isaac Asimov used to say, science fiction uh, readers are people who escape from reality into worlds of pollution, nuclear war, overpopulation, and <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a way of modeling the future or the present through the through the future. So, you know, growing up in the '60s, coming to my kind of um, um, intellectual awakening in, in, in high school uh, at a time when the world was in complete chaos between the war in Vietnam and, and civil rights and all of the upheavals, all the social upheavals, you know, uh, free love, uh, you know, everything that was happening in the late 60s, it, um, it, it gave one a, an interesting perspective, being a science fiction fan and looking at a world that was coming apart and thinking in very apocalyptic terms about that world. And I've never lost that sort of um, uh, almost a, a, a fascination with apocalyptic themes, and Titanic is just another manifestation of that, because for me, that film was just a, a microcosm for uh, the way the world ends. Uh, however it ends, we don't know, but if it ends by, by the human hand, it'll end in the way that Titanic ended, which is through, through some casual, simple carelessness. Um, so, you know, being, being a, a child of the 60s in, in, in that way, I think, very much influenced the way I, I looked at uh, what could be done with film. It was also a very interesting time in filmmaking, the history of filmmaking, because it was the, the time when the, when the, when the paradigm of, of studio film production was completely deconstructed and, and the independent films emerged and all of a sudden the world, the, the filmmaking world was turned on its head and a film called Easy Rider came out that was made for $40,000 and made more money than any other film of that year, including all of the big studio films. And so the, the big smokestack industry of Hollywood was suddenly threatened from within by these, these auteurs, these, these punks, these, these young, you know, George Lucases and, and, and Martin Scorsese's. And, um, you know, so it was a fascinating time, and, and that's the time at which I came into my awareness of what film was and what film could be, so I was, I was definitely informed by that. But I would say I didn't really have anything to say yet. You know, I, I just had a lot of images and ideas, but, but I, hadn't, I hadn't, you know, found my themes. And it took, took time for that to happen. It took another few years. Never give up because it's going to be unbelievably hard. It's going to be a, a ridiculously brutal uphill fight all the time. And you just have to have tremendous stamina and, and self-confidence to, to power through it. Um, you have to not listen to the naysayers because there will be many. And often they'll be much more qualified than you and cause you to sort of doubt yourself. But you know what I learned from those early days was to trust trust my instincts, and to uh, to not back off, um, because when the hour gets dark, 
your instinct is to, or your, your, your tendency might be to say, well, this is just too hard, and no, you know, nobody should have to go through this in order to accomplish X, whether it's a movie or, or, or whatever. But to, to in, in the pursuit of excellence, and I think you can be in the pursuit of excellence when you're working on a low-budget science fiction horror film, if it's how you define it, um, you have to go all the way. It's that simple. Now, I don't mean trample over people. I don't mean turn into a, to, into a screaming maniac. I mean you have to be able, you have to have made that commitment within yourself to do whatever it takes to get the job done and to try to inspire other people to do it. Because obviously the first rule is you can't do it all yourself. Even though you may know how to do many of these different tasks, you physically can't do it. And you need, you need a team and you need the, the respect and the trust of that team. So that was, that was a, a lesson that took me a while to figure out because at first I just wanted to do it all myself. I was like, ah, you're doing it wrong. You know? And that doesn't, that doesn't work. That doesn't ultimately achieve the, the vision, whatever the vision is, whether it's you know, someone else's vision or when you, you know, in my case, when I started directing, it was my vision. I couldn't, I couldn't push people out of the way. I had, to, I had to learn to inspire people to give me their best work. And I also had to learn to accept what they brought, even if it was either A, not as good, or B, good but just different from what I had imagined, and say that the, the end result of, of our collective efforts will be exactly that. It'll be um, all of our efforts together. It won't, it won't ever be exactly the way um, I imagined it. And that, that's, I think, an, an important lesson as well, is that in any group enterprise, it's going to be the sum total of the of the group. So choose your group well and go go in with that little voice in the back of your mind that says be be zen about it, be philosophical. It's ultimately going to be the best that these people can do. And you know, that's that's a, an interesting thing because it a little bit flies in the face of the auteur the auteur theory. Um, and I, I was sort of I was sort of raised aesthetically on that on that auteur theory, you know, and, and looking at, you know, we the much vaunted Hitchcock films that were planned down to every frame and every molecule through storyboarding, and it all, f you know, flowed from the from the forehead of Zeus. It's not that way. You know, you're you're a band leader. When you're doing your job best, you're a band leader. It's tough, and I'm still I'm still learning it. Uh, but I've learned it well enough, I think, to do some of my best work as a result of that lesson. You know, by inspiring the actors on Titanic. And, and in fact, everyone on that film, the production designers, the people that were, you know, there, there, there were several thousand people working on that film by somehow inspiring them to do their very, very best. They brought me, I think, the, the, um, all of the elements, all of the moments that eventually became that film. I couldn't have done it all myself. Couldn't have done a fraction of it. I had dark hours on Titanic that were just as dire, if not more dire, than on my on, on Piranha 2 when I got fired, on Terminator when we had you know all these problems. I think that that there's just an I think that you have to find some kind of inner strength that says what I'm doing is right. It may not seem right to other people, and I, I may not be able to please them right now, and I'm going to have to proceed on this path for a while until I can demonstrate to them that what we're doing is probably the right thing, at least the best that I know how to do. And ultimately, you reach a point where people will hire you because you have uh, the strength, or the, some people call it vision. I don't know, I, that, that's a bit of a lofty word um, because I don't think it's something that comes to you necessarily in, in the night. I think it's something that's the process of, of, of a very rigorous, mental processing of the data on a day-by-day -day basis and, and, and the possibilities, what you can do and what you can't do. Um, and over time, people will realize that, that you have what it takes to be in that situation where nobody really knows the answer, uh, although a lot of them think they do or say they do, um, and you've come up with the right formula. And to have come out of these battle situations a number of times with the right formula on a consistent basis, uh, they tend to trust you more as you go along. They'll never trust you completely. The they, whoever the they is. In my, in my business, it's, it's uh, you know, the studio that, that's putting up the money, the completion bond company, whatever, the bankers. The people that don't really understand 
the day-to-day -day sweat, blood, and tears of, of the creative process. Because it's, that's another lofty term, the creative process. When you're on a set, the creative process consists of, oh my God, how are we gonna do that? You're gonna have to move the wall back three feet, and then you're gonna have to pile up some boxes over here and put the camera on it. It's all nuts and bolts things. And then you have to be able to switch that off in a heartbeat and think about what's the actor feeling? You know, what's the, what's the character feeling at that moment? And it might be some really important, very pivotal scene for them, so. Um, I, I would say there's, there's a certain tenacity that's required and that tenacity manifests itself sometimes in, in, in unpleasant ways and other times it can manifest itself in very, in very noble ways when you can get other people to go with you that extra mile. And um, I think a lot about uh, uh, of what is misunderstood about, about my particular filmmaking process is that I get people to go that extra mile that they've never done before. And they go into new territory. They go beyond what they previously thought were their limits. And then afterwards, they talk about it like it was a big adventure. Oh man, we worked around the clock and you know we all almost died. And it sounds like an indictment of the, of the production as a bunch of wackos. But when in fact, they're actually, um, they, they wanna share the fact that they, that they did this, that, they, that they, they did go beyond. They went beyond in their, in their creative capacity as well. And that's why they always all come back and want to do it again. Maybe just not right away. <laughs> but I don't, make, I don't make films back to back anyway, so that I usually give them a year to go out and see what it's like on all those other boring movies, and then they, then they all want to come back. I lived in a small town. It was 2,000 people in Canada. Um, little river that went through it, and we swam in the, in, you know, a lot of water around. Niagara Falls was about four or five miles away, the Niagara Falls. And uh, so, you know, I've, I've always sort of loved the water, uh, possibly as a result of that. And that's manifested itself, obviously, in my, in my work and in my, my own uh, private time. I do an awful lot of scuba diving. I love to be on the ocean, under the ocean, live next to the ocean. But, um, you know, in terms of, of uh, you know, some wild family dynamics or anything like that, nothing that would necessarily indicate anything. Um, I would say my, mo my mother was uh, an artist. She was actually a housewife, but she, you know, she was an, uh, an amateur artist. My father was an electrical engineer. So right there you have a collision of, of you know, left and right hemisphere <laughs> uh, thinking. Um, and I, I think I got sort of equal parts of, of both. Uh, my mother was definitely an influence in giving me a respect for, for art and the arts, and uh, especially the visual arts. And I used to, you know, go with her to museums and so on. And I, when I when I was learning to draw, I would sketch things in the museum, whether it was an Etruscan helmet or a mummy or, or whatever. I just I was fascinated by all that. Um, you know, I think out of out of an, uh, you know, an attempt maybe to, to get my father's respect or, or interest or, or whatever, uh, you know, I, I was, or, or maybe it was just a genetically passed through love of technology. Uh, I was always fascinated by engineering, always trying to build things, definitely a builder. And sometimes being a builder can put you in a leadership position when you're a kid because then it's like, hey, let's build a go-kart. Uh, well, you go get the wheels and you get this and pretty soon you're at the center of a project. Uh, and. Uh, I think that, that um, you know, certain things must just be genetic because I look back at you know, who I was at 10 years old or nine years old and I'm the same person now, you know, and, and uh, in, in, in essence, in, the, in uh, uh, wanting, to, uh, wanting to build things and wanting to get a lot of people together and do some grandiose thing, whether it was build a fort or a tree house or an airplane once we built an airplane, not intending it to fly, just hang from a tree, but you know. Uh, that sort of thing. And I realize I'm just doing the same thing now, just getting a bunch of kids to, you know, help me build a fort. Except that now it takes, you know, $100 million and the kids are all my age. Yes, good student. Um, mostly because of curiosity. I mean, a real natural curiosity. I wasn't trying to please anybody. I wasn't trying to... Um, it was, for me, it wasn't competitive against the other kids. It wasn't about trying to please my parents so much as I just wanted to, to know things. The sciences, history, even math uh, to an extent. Uh, I was just 
you know, I was just switched on somehow. And I, I think, you know, um, that's the most important thing when I look back to that formative period, and I'm thinking junior high through, through high school, that it was a six year period, um, it was curiosity. And I, I'd spent all my free time in, in the, the town library, and I, I read an awful lot of science fiction. And the, 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 the sort of the, the line between, between reality and fantasy blurred, you know? I mean, I, I was as interested in the reality of biology as I was in reading science fiction stories about, you know, genetic mutations and post-nuclear war environments and distant, you know, interstellar travel and meeting alien races and all that sort of thing. I read so voraciously. I mean, it was, it was tonnage. I, I rode a school bus um, to school for an hour each way each day in, in, in high school uh, because they, they put me in a, in, a, in a program, an academic program that could only be serviced by this high school that was much further away. So I had two hours a day on the bus and I read, I tried to read a book a day. Um, and usually it was, it averaged a book every other day. But if I got really interested in something, it was b propped up behind my, my math book or my, my science book, you know, all during the day in class. Um, so it was, it was really more by authors, you know, it would have been, uh, you know, Arthur Clarke and uh, A.E. Van Vogt, all the, the kind of the, the mainstream old guard of, of science fiction at that time. And then in the latter years of high school, then you get into the, the newer, you know, the newer guys at that time, uh, you know, uh, Harlan Ellison, uh, Larry Niven, uh, people like that. But it was, it was pretty much a steady diet of science fiction. A critical moment for me I would have to say was in it was in my um, uh, we didn't call them sophomore senior year sort of things there it was in in the in the eleventh uh, grade um, my biology teacher Mr. McKenzie decided that what our school needed was a theater arts program and we didn't have it. it there was you know there was wrestling basketball football you know it was a very jock oriented school and there was no theater program whatsoever so we started a theater program from scratch we bootstrapped it. Uh, he, he taught it, and I think he might have done it for nothing. And uh, we took, you know, we took the class, but we really had to, we had to build the props and the scenery and the costumes and just do everything ourselves. And we had to turn the, the you know, the stage into a proper working stage. And uh, it took a year, but we started putting on our own productions. And, and I think that was really a pivotal moment. And, uh, you know, so my, my biology teacher was, the, was uh, our, our muse at that time. And uh, I think the fact that we were having to do everything, that it wasn't handed to us, may have um, created a kind of a, a work ethic that paid off then in independent film production because it's the same thing. You know, you're, you're finding scraps and bits and pieces and putting it all together and putting on a show. And it's that sense of being able to, to create some moment of glory, some showmanship out of nothing, out of bailing wire uh, that... Um, is maybe the lesson that was learned there as a result of this, this man who just decided to have a theater arts program. Otherwise, you know, I would have been just, you know, somebody who was sh marginalized by the fact that it was a very athletically oriented school. And now I've gone back to the school uh, recently and, and found out that the theater program is the thing that the school is most proud of. Their teams are doing terribly but their theater program is doing great and they're winning in all these you know dramatic uh, dramatic awards around the uh, around the province this is back in canada so that's his legacy but anyway i think the the point is that that is that um, a a teacher can be absolutely critical at the right moment uh, in your life and it can be uh, um uh, a mentor, and sometimes it's it's only just one comment that the, that they can make. And I remember I was talking to this this man, my biology teacher, and and he said, you know, I've seen your your uh, your aptitude tests or whatever kind of testing they did back then, uh, you know, 30 years ago in Canada, and um, we believe that you have unlimited potential. Now. I don't know if he'd ever seen the tests, and I don't know if any of the data indicated that, but hearing that and knowing that somebody somewhere believed that I could go accomplish something was a big contributor to the self-confidence necessary to overcome all these things later, because you're gonna have 10,000 people telling you why you can't do something. Sometimes it only takes one person to tell you that you can do something, and you take it to heart. 
Otherwise, I wouldn't have remembered it all these years, you know, and I remember where the conversation took place. I certainly didn't think of myself as gifted. Um, certainly the standards for being gifted in, in my environment were if you were, if you were good in Little League or if you were good in football or, you know, so, so I, was, I was more like the, like the, um, uh, the kind of the misfit, the outsider. And of course the misfits and the outsiders all collect together, like this kind of, you know, pawn scum around the sides. And, uh, and that's where all the, you know, the, I think the, the good ideas come from. I certainly never thought of myself as, as uh, you know, superior or gifted in any way, just different, def definitely different. And, and hap satisfied to be different. Maybe not always happy to be different, but satisfied to be different. What it, your defense mechanism becomes to be, you know, contemptuous of people who don't think outside of the box. And, um, you know, now, I, now I, you know, I've, I've spent, I spent maybe, you know, a 10 year period in there, you know, uh, being in a way kind of uh, intellectually snobbish and saying, you know, you guys are just a bunch of jock idiots. And then I've spent the last, you know, 25 years trying to reintegrate myself into a kind of a normal, be, you know, being, being a normal person uh, and uh, with, you know, limited success probably. But. Uh. <laughs>
but half of it will be right, and that's the part you're going you're gonna to prevail with. The films that influenced me were, were so disparate that there's almost no pattern. I, it, Stanley Kubrick was, was a, an influence because I loved 2001 A Space Odyssey, and the more I learned about him and his methodology, the more I realized what a, what a, what a, uh, a rigorous, uh, um, I don't even want to use the word perfectionist because that has a kind of a fussy connotation of, of unnecessary work, of unnecessary complication of the process. I think that his process was, was uh, everything he did was necessary. Um, and it, but it was, it, was, it was a rigorous intellectual exercise for him. And I was inspired by that. I've since come to, to learn that for myself it doesn't work that well. That there has to be, there has to be some chaos, there has to be some uh, looseness so, that the, so that, the, that the actors are given the opportunities that they need to uh, give you their best. Um, and that you have to not have preconceived it in such crystallinely perfect form that you don't leave the door open for the magic. Because the magic doesn't come from, from within the, the director's mind, it comes from within the hearts of the, of the actors, I believe. And, and so you, you just have to be there to kind of seize it at the right moment. But that was definitely an influence and an important, an important influence. Then the films, it was all the films that I saw in the, my last two years of high school. Those are the films that I, and, and maybe my first year of college, those are the films that still burn very vividly for me. And they were everything from Woodstock to Catch-22 to Easy Rider to um, The Graduate. You know, it was such a, an amazing time. I mean, up through, let's say, The Godfather. You know, it was just such an amazing time in film production. Bonnie and Clyde, um, you know, uh, just, just an amazing uh, time, very eclectic and, and just breaking all the rules. Well, Star Wars was very interesting because um, that was probably the film that galvanized me to get off my butt and go be a filmmaker. And, and the way it worked for me was that, that um, you know, I was an artist, I was fascinated by space, I was always painting spaceships and, and living in this world of these whizzing, you know, uh, dynamic uh, space battles and all that sort of thing. And I, could, I used to play, you know, um, we used to play Battleship when we were in class where, you know, we'd just send coordinates to each other by notes and try to blow. Well, we turned it into Space Battleship and we'd draw these elaborate spaceships and try to blow each other up. You know, that's, that was, you know, my, my senior year in high school. So, you know, I was living in a Star Wars world in my mind and, and all of a sudden I saw this film and it was like somebody had reached into my, my hind brain and yanked out a lot of stuff that was in there and I was seeing it on the screen, realized. And not to take anything away from, from, from George's creation because it's obviously a phenomenal milestone, but my reaction to it was not, oh wow, that's cool, I wanna see more. It was, oh wow, I better get off my butt because somebody's doing this stuff and, and, it, it, you know, and they're beating me to it. <laughs> That was that was my reaction. So, uh, I you know I, I basically quit my job and started uh, you know doing a little film with visual effects and sucked my friends into that vortex and we all quit our jobs and fortunately we've all managed to successfully transition into filmmaking of that of that little group of four people. The thing that is exciting about filmmaking. Is to, is to think back to the moment in time right before you had the idea and think about that at the moment that you're st sitting or standing on the set and there are thousands of people around and they've built this huge set and there are all these actors and there's all this energy and all this focus and realize that it's all in the service of, of something that was made up out of whole cloth. You know, I mean, that's fun. I mean, that, that's what an architect must feel like when they drive down the street and they look up and see a building that they designed. It's something that you imagined made tangible. And I, I get that rush much more on the set than I do when the film is done. Because for some reason, when the film is done, you've lived with it for so long that it's not new anymore. And it's, it almost seems like just destiny. That's just what it is. But there's a time on the set when it's, when it's new and you can walk into it and you can see it and it's this f physical, tangible manifestation of pure imagination. Uh, now, 
as much fun as that is, it becomes a curse the next time you sit down and face the blank CRT and you have to come up with something because you know that there's going to be a moment in time when everybody's going to be standing around having built this and having gathered to do it and this huge human em enterprise, and you better think of something good, you know. So it, it's, sort of, it's sort of the rush that you get out of it, but it's also the, uh, the, the, the thing that haunts you before you start. I think that, that characterizing whatever I've brought to filmmaking is probably best left to others. Um, I know what I've tried to do, which is tell stories that, that um, excite the imagination and maybe say something at a, at a thematic level, uh, maybe something about the human condition with respect to uh, our, our human relationship with technology, because ultimately I think all my stories have been about that to one degree or another. and. Um, uh, to allow people to step through that screen into, into that world, whatever it is, you know, whether it's the world of the abyss or the, the world of the Terminator or, or, or Titanic, to let people live in that, create that space for them and let them live in, in, uh, in the shoes of those characters for a while. That's what I, that's what I set out to do. It's up, I think it's, it's uh, really up to others to sort of sort it out. Uh, what, what it ultimately means. The thing is that, that I, see, I see my things that I've done that I know were inspired by other things. I see then other filmmakers picking up on my leads, taking it further, and I realize that it's part of an ongoing creative process that, that, that uh, is kind of self-perpetuating. Self and I, so I, I think of myself as part of a, uh, as, as a link in a chain of, of cinematic ideas, and it's fun. It's fun to, to, to have that place. Ultimately, the, front, the frontiers of filmmaking have never changed. I mean, I think they change in the specifics of, of the technology and the technique. But ultimately, it's, it's somebody sitting in a room writing, it's actors saying the lines in front of a lens, and that image being captured, and that little slice of life, that, those characters, those relationships, being made alive in the minds of other people all around the world. I don't think that is fundamentally going to change indefinitely. I think the specifics are going to probably change a lot. You know, we'll have electronic digital uh, presentation of the films, you know, projection of the films. That's going to then start to inform the entire post-production process where we're ultimately we won't be working on film anymore. We'll call it film, but there won't be any film involved. Uh, it may be shot uh, electronically. Film itself, as a, as a substance, as a, as a thing, may be obsolete within within ten to, to twenty years. Other than you know, atavistic art, artists who choose to shoot on film because of some real or perceived artistic need, in the same way that that people still make pots by hand, even though there are machines that make them beautifully. Um, but um, I think that uh, you know, from a from a visual effects standpoint, I think that visual effects are, are it's happening now. It's not even the next frontier. Visual effects are just becoming integrated into the basic fabric of filmmaking, where they're not something other. They're not something that um, uh, is uh, outside of the normal filmmaking process. Now all directors are working with visual effects, uh, and it's just become as basic to the technique as as a light or a dolly or. Or, or whatever, um, which is good, I think. This is good. It's good to think of, uh, to, to uh, um, it's empowering, I think, to the imagination to let people create whatever it is they want to create and do it in a very, um, uh, in a very easy and straightforward manner, which visual effects are now capable of doing because of the ease of, of uh, digital compositing. In terms of computer graphics and, and animation, I think that's going to continue to, to uh, uh, have an increasing role. And um, I think that uh, you know, very real characters will come out of that. I don't think we're going to replace actors. They're going to have to be non-human characters. I think there has to be a reason to do a CG character. And the reason is it can't be you or I. It can't be somebody that you, that you cast and stick in front of a camera. It's got to be something different. But in the traditional techniques of putting rubber on people's faces and making rubber puppets and moving them with hydraulics and so on, I think are, are going to fall by the wayside. Actors will still be empowered within that process because it'll ultimately still be a performance created by an actor at some, in some way. They just won't have five pounds of makeup stuck on their face.
there are many things that I'd, that I'd love to do. There are still a lot of stories that I want to tell. Um, I get very excited by all kinds of different stories. I'd love to do a film uh, with a scientist as a main character and, uh, and really try to communicate to people the passion of science because I don't, because it, our culture thinks science is kind of unhip, you know. Scientists get it, but I think that the greater community doesn't understand how scientists think, what drives them, and how their passion can be as great as the, as the passion of an artist or the passion of a, of a great athlete, which, are, which our culture respects much more, unfortunately. Um, I'd love to be able to crack that nut because I don't think it's been done well. I don't think Hollywood has served the science community well. Um, they're usually stereotypes, you know, geeks, bad guys, um, or distant, unemotional people. And of course, none of that is true, or it can certainly be true of individuals, but it's not generally true. I used to think that the great films that I saw, the great works of art, were just something that somebody imagined in every detail and then went and did. I didn't realize that the creative process is is the end result of a lot of different people bringing a lot of different things to the table and it's impossible to predict and it's a real-time monitoring, shaping, molding process that goes along and the end result may be quite different than, than, than what you imagined when you, you started out. Um, but that that's, what, that's how it works. That's what it is. Um, in terms of, of achievement, you know, I'm, I'm at an interesting point right now because I've just, uh, you know, just having done this, this film, it's definitely a, a, a high watermark, and I have, to, I have to evaluate what that means. Do I let, do I let the success of that overpower my, my artistic instincts? You know, because I, there's a lot of things I want to do, and, and some of them I know for certain are going to be disappointments to people who think that, that you know, I'm, I'm going to come out and, and try to kick Titanic's butt, because it might be some little intimate thing, or it might be something that's a little off-center. And I think that... Um, um, what I find interestingly enough is that sometimes um, success brings with it a tremendous amount of scrutiny and anticipation of what's going to happen next and that that's not a good thing necessarily that the, you don't you want to have the freedom to just just react instinctively as an artist and not second guess not second guess yourself um, so you know when I've been speaking Speaking to, to young people, which I've been doing a lot lately, that are, that are right at the at the the cusp of of sort of deciding the, their path, I relate to where I am right now. I relate where I am right now a little bit to, to where I was when I was 17, 18 years old, and thinking, oh, I'm, I'm, I've got to make this big decision. You know, I've got to make this big decision what I'm going to be, and if I mess it up, I mess up my whole life. You know, and it's just not like that. It's um it's an evolving process. So the I think the the illumination that I, I might be able to share that might mean something to people that are 17, 18, 19 years old and right in that point where they just think they've got to make this big decision is you've got time. As long as you follow your heart, you'll be going the right direction for you. It may not be the direction that everybody around you thinks you should be going, but it'll be what's ultimately right for you. And I think the problem for a lot of people, especially when they show great potential, is that all of a sudden you've got 50 people in your hip pocket telling you what you should be and what you should do. Um, and that sometimes people need a push. Other times that those voices can be, can be deflecting you off, off your true course. And I didn't find my true course until I was 25, so you've got time. I don't think you have till you're 45, but I think you have at least until you're you know, in your, in your mid-20s. And of course there are, there are stories, a legion of people who don't find their true calling until they are in their 40s or 50s. I had the, um, the great opportunity to uh, become briefly friends with a, a woman who, who uh, died recently at the age of 105. She's an artist in California named, named Beatrice Wood. And she was a little bit the inspiration for the character in, in Titanic. In, fa in fact, I called her up and asked her permission to use her a little bit, to interview her and use her as a kind of a model for this character, even though Beatrice had no connection to Titanic itself. And she said, oh, I, I couldn't possibly do that because I'm only 35. She, she you know, she was, she was 102 at the time. Um, she didn't, she was an artist who, who, none of her significant work was done before she was 90. She kind of switched on when she hit 90. And that's, I think that's an interesting thing to remember.
what people call obsession or passion uh, for me is just a work ethic. And I think it comes a little bit from an insecurity that I'm not good enough, you know, that, uh, that I have to, that there are other people out there that I admire, that I, that I, that I, that I grew up admiring, that are, that, that are still, you know, that are still making movies and those movies are great. And, you know, I've got to compete with these, these guys and these, these, these women. And, and, you know, have I thought of everything? Have I thought of every detail? Is this the best the scene can be? You know, so that it, it, it comes a little bit from a healthy insecurity, the healthy insecurity that makes you better, that makes you better as an artist. Um, and just from a kind of gonzo intensity, you know, I mean, it's just, I just like to do it full bore. Uh, for me, it's not about being comfortable. Um, I want to be in there. I want to help the guys move the dolly. I'm, I'm at my best when I'm neck deep in ice water, trying to work out how we're going to, you know, keep the lights turned on when the water hits the hits the the, the bulbs. You know, I mean, the the more the challenge is, the more I enjoy it, and the more I can lead lead other people into these situations where they all think they're going to die, the more fun I'm having. Uh, so, needless to say, there are, that we have a few washouts. We have a few people that don't like my version of day camp. Uh, but I would say that, that uh, 80 or 90 percent of them feel like they've been through something. They've done, their, they've done the best that they've, they've done in their professional careers, and they're usually uh, pretty eager to re-up for another one. Well, as a Canadian, the American dream had a, had a, a very negative and pejorative connotation when I was growing up because it was this kind of, you know, cultural imperialism. Um, you know, I grew up in a border town on the other side of the border in Niagara Falls, Canada. And, uh, but, you know, since I, I, I moved uh, to the United States at the age of 17, I actually feel very much like, like uh, I, I'm probably in my basic genetic nature much more American than Canadian because I really believe in a lot of the I, be, I believe uh, strongly in a lot of the traditional values of this country in terms of, of uh, respecting uh, individuals' rights, the, the, uh, the rights to you know, the freedom, freedom of speech, and a lot of the, a lot of the things that, uh, that, are, that are in the basic fabric of, the, of this country. And I think that you know, Americans and, and Canadians even to, to, an ex, to, to a large extent, are, are, they come from, from frontiersman stock. Uh, so they're they're people who hew, you know hewed their civilization out of the out of the wilderness. It wasn't given to them. You know, it's not like people growing up in in Italy or France in the shadow of past glories from thousands of years before. It, you know, we made what we have, and we don't have a great cultural depth like they do. But what we have is ours by God, and. Um, you know, I I like that. I like that about it. You know, it, it sort of it sort of puts your, your hand on the tiller of destiny in a way. And, and America definitely has their, the, the, its hand on the, on the tiller of destiny for this planet. For good or bad doesn't mean you know what you're doing, <laughs> necessarily. But the other thing is that Americans are, are very, very happy to, to, to argue like crazy about everything and just hold, hold things up to ridicule and challenge that other countries just take for granted. And I think that that's a good thing. I mean, the whole Monica Lewinsky thing is the dark side of that. You know, it just goes on and on forever, and the other countries all think we're a bunch of idiots. But it's it's a manifestation of a good thing that 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 uh, everything has to be examined and challenged, and that's that's a great thing. I mean, certainly, you know, from a from an achievement standpoint, anybody can come here from anywhere, and if you've got the goods, it's a meritocracy. You know, it's it. Yes, there are there are there are inequities, just like anywhere. But the in, but we challenge the inequities. We, we're we're trying. We're trying. You know, trying to 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 evolve. Other countries aren't. Many other countries, certain other countries, aren't even trying to evolve. They're not trying to challenge those inequities. You know. So I think that there's something that can happen here that's unique, and certainly because America has embedded within it this um, uh, this thing called Hollywood or the movies or whatever, which is this kind of um, mecca to which filmmakers from all over the world come and participate. It's become a kind of entertainment slash, you know, pop culture leader for the, for the world. And so there's a, there's a grave responsibility in that as well. 
I'm not sure that that responsibility is necessarily being, <laughs> being uh, uh, you know, that mantle is being worn well necessarily right now, but, uh, uh, but it's the place to be, you know. I could go on for hours about, about that.